Historical biological records are a major part of the evidence that scientists are using to determine the significance of changes occurring in the natural world in response to shifts in temperature. At the University of Queensland, scientists from a variety of disciplines are researching this to better understand the changes in climate and environment linked to global warming. It is only by looking into our geological past that we can begin to understand how we are shaping the future. Changes in climate and, and trying to identify changes in climate usually take two key pathways. One is we look at the historical observational record and, and that is relatively short. In Australia here we have about 100 to 150 years, if we're lucky, of, of robust observational records of temperature and rainfall, wind speed and direction and barometric pressure and alike. And we can analyse those records and detrend them for the impact of urbanisation. You know, often climate change sceptics seize upon that as, as evidence that it's not anthropogenic global warming, that it's an urban heat island effect. Well, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to remove an urban heat island effect from a temperature record from a station. So we take away those sorts of um, influences on the record so we have a robust, reliable record and then we look at it for trends through time. The other thing we need to do, because we have such a short record, is to look at the paleo record of climate. So we look at ice cores, which are probably the best recorders of past climate available to us, and they extend back about 800,000 years. We look at marine sediment cores, or cores from terrestrial environments. Here in southeast Queensland, we've been developing over a number of years paleo climate records to try and resolve how climate in this very rapidly growing region of Australia has changed in the past. Once again, really to build some underpinning sound science that we can use to aid us in projections of future climate. My work is focused on using satellite imagery to look at the environment. Every photo is analysed for what's there, for the percentage of coral, algae, seagrass, and all of that will translate in habitat maps and then look at the changes that are taking place over time. This is, for instance, uh, the western province in the Solomon Islands. And there is an interest in understanding how sea level rise and climate change is impacting the villages and, and the coral reef. So remote sensing, satellite imagery and field data is one of the starting points. Here you see villages along the coastline of Vanavona Lagoon, where um, the villages go out to these reefs to go fishing. And of course these villages are of importance for them, because that will give them their resources to live. This image is acquired, I think, in 2008. The image you will see now is an image from 2010. And what you see is the roads occurring and all the little roads. And that bare ground starts to occur on the image. And that's as a result of logging. By monitoring it at this large spatial scale, which is only possible with satellite imagery, they are very powerful to help convince uh, managers that they have to take action to create um, no fishing areas for, for areas that are weak already, to take care that it doesn't lose its strength. A lot of my research is geared toward understanding the effects of climate change over different temporal scales. To try to get an understanding of the recent past history of living marine organisms, I look at corals, foraminifera, coral and algae, clams and snails, how communities and populations of these organisms have changed over time. We're coring nearshore reefs and looking at the history of those reefs over the last 1500 to 2000 years. And we can reconstruct the communities over time to get an idea of how those communities existed prior to European colonization of Australia, for example. But we can also look at those cores to tell us something about the natural response of coral reefs to natural climate change in the, in the past. There's a lot of differences between the climate change that we're seeing today and climate change in the past. For example, temperatures uh, hundreds of millions of years ago were several degrees warmer than they are today, up to four to six degrees. And CO2 levels have been up to 6,000 parts per million by volume. So one can look at that information and say, oh, well, you know, temperatures have been higher in the past and CO2 has been higher in the past. What's the problem? There are several problems. 
biggest problem is that the rate of sea level rise that we're seeing today is unprecedented in the geological past, and it completely dwarfs any rates of CO2 rise. That's important because when CO2 rises so quickly, the pH of the oceans decreases dramatically. Then the ability of corals to calcify and other organisms, their ability to calcify is reduced dramatically as well. Now that we have those dramatic increases so happening so quickly, that buffering mechanism that, that operates over tens of thousands of years doesn't have time to re-equilibrate. When you start looking at the link between changes in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the changes in temperature, and then the changes in Arctic sea ice cover and the changes in snowfall, then you start to build up a weight of evidence which becomes extremely compelling in terms of the impact that humanity is having on climate. And that really is only a consequence of us burning fossil fuels and changing land cover. The large body of scientific evidence is leading many of the world's top scientists to conclude that changes in climate are already apparent and having a real and measurable effect on all of our ecosystems. For example, the IPCC brings together hundreds of scientists from every corner of the world to provide an objective source of information regarding all aspects of physical and environmental sciences, tracking change and assessing impacts. Many scientists are now exploring options for adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Depending on our pathway that we decide to take um, for CO2 uh, emissions over time, we'll give us the end result on what we need to be doing, you know, or where, where things are going to be heading in terms of our ecological systems. We are looking at two very different futures and it's not too late to take the action that's needed to try and provide reefs this, this future that many people will benefit from.